Hello everyone, how's it going? It is Tyranor as always, and I haven't done a top X in a while, so I guess it's time. This time it is my top 6 retcons. Uh, for those unaware, a retcon is when, in this instance, Blizzard states later on that a previous part of lore is no longer canon, or replaces said lore with something else, or otherwise changes the story of their games, and so on. Now, usually that tends to be pretty annoying for lore hounds like me, but there are instances where retconning can be a good thing, and I aim to name a few of those instances now. So uh, without further ado, here we go. Number 6 on my list would be the origins of Chen Stormstout. Namely, in his first appearance in Warcraft 3, he proudly declared himself a brewmaster of Pandaria. And that's obviously been retconned ever since, namely the fact that he is not from Pandaria, but from the Wandering Isle. And the story of Pandaria has been greatly expanded upon, as has been the story of Chen himself. I like the, this retcon because, obviously, without it there would have been no Pandaria storyline in its current form, and it also brought us the storyline of the Yi Wandering Isle and of Chen Stormstout's family, which I have previously commented on saying that it is one of my personal favorite parts of the lore. So Chen nowadays may not be a native of Pandaria himself, but rather he, along with his niece Lily, was one, were one of the first outsiders to land on it uh, ever since the Sundering. Before Mists of Pandaria, Pandaria and the Pandaren were only really presented in the RPG books as a sort of mysterious place, but nonetheless kind of stereotypical. Though some of the minor details presented in the RPG, such as the Pandaren having come into contact with the ancient Night Elves, were preserved in the new lore. Number 5 on my list, and probably my most controversial pick, was the changing of Sargeras' motives for turning evil in the Warcraft Chronicle. Now, beforehand, Sargeras' motive was that he basically uh, grew tired and more and more contemplative and depressed over the millennia of fighting demons while he was a member of the Pantheon, and eventually he sort of just stopped seeing the point of the work the Titans were doing, and decided instead that life basically had no meaning or sense and that he would destroy it. In Chronicle, however, Sargeras is given more of a grey motivation. While on his travels throughout the cosmos, Sargeras came across an unborn titan corrupted by the old gods, and, after interrogating a few local dreadlords, discovered the truth about the creatures of the void and the immense danger they posed to the universe. Sargeras then destroyed the unborn titan in order to prevent its corruption, and tried to make the other titans see the danger the void posed. The Pantheon instead condemned Sargeras for his rash action and refused to see things from his point of view that all life in the universe was at risk of being corrupted by the Void. Sargeras then stormed off and meditated on what could be done to save the cosmos, and eventually came to the conclusion that the only solution was to destroy all life in the universe in order to prevent the Void from corrupting and consuming it. Now, I am personally more of a fan of morally grey characters rather than absolutely evil or absolutely good ones, and this change in Sargeras' character, in my opinion, makes his decision a bit more understandable, arguably a more personal one from our point of view, rather than the maybe a bit random turnabout he had in the previous lore. This is of course just my opinion and you are free to disagree. Number 4 on my list was the colorization of the dragons, so to say. Now, dragons, when they were first introduced in Warcraft 2, were sort of the uh, generic fantasy dragons you might see in other franchises, with their only defining trait being that they were enslaved by the orcs in the first game, and that they had a queen named Alexstrasza. Later on, Deathwing was introduced as sort of the evil dragon. However, Blizzard decided to give their dragons a personality, I guess you could say, by coloring them differently and giving each separate flight a different charge. This, I think, is one of the better things in Warcraft lore, which separate it, separates it in a way from other fantasy, fa fantasy franchises, since this colorization of dragons effectively gave them personality and allowed for the development of individual stories and even politics among the dragons that were more than just, oh, adventurers fighting a dragon for its treasure, so to say. Sure, some of the stories may not be the best, and some may take issue with certain authors, 
but overall it made for a great positive change in my opinion. Number 3 on my list was the changing of Anduin Lothar's death from Warcraft 2. In both cases, both in the current version and the previous version of the lore, Anduin Lothar died at the Battle of Black Ark Mountain, but the manner of his death differs. In the original game, in keeping with the portrayal at the time that all orcs were savage monsters, uh, Lothar went to negotiate with the orcs before the battle, only for his party to be ambushed and Lothar killed in the ensuing combat. The current version of events, however, is that in the middle of the gigantic battle, Lothar and Orgrim Doomhammer saw each other and raced towards one another. Both thought that killing the enemy commander would deliver a crippling blow to their respective armies. An epic duel ensued and the battle itself seemed to grind to a halt in order to witness the outcome. In the end, Doomhammer barely managed to defeat and kill Lothar after sustaining several injuries himself. He taunted the surviving humans, but then Lothar's second in command, Turalyon, rallied. He cried out in righteous fury at the orcs and rallied the Alliance army, turning Lothar's death from a potentially devastating blow to an impetus for driving out the orcs once and for all. Turalyon knocked out the barely standing Doomhammer and took up Lothar's broken sword, ordering his forces to charge the now discouraged and breaking orcs. It's a much more epic moment than the previous version of events, don't you think? It serves as a greatly defining moment for Turalyon himself, it stands as one of the most important moments in the Second War, and for us orc lovers like me, it also transforms the previous image of the orcs uh, ruthlessly ambushing a peace party into an honorable duo. So win-win all around, I say. Number 2 on my list is the reworking of the human religion from Warcraft 1 and 2. Now originally, back when, in a way, Warcraft was more of a generic fantasy universe with fewer original elements, the orcs and humans were portrayed in a sort of medieval way in that the humans were good Christians with actual Christian symbolism on their buildings, while their orcs were evil and consorted with the demons of hell, literally. As you probably are well aware now, orcs are not devil spawns consorting with the forces of hell and the humans uh, worship the holy light for the most part, obviously. Obviously a few references to hell and the lore have continued to make their appearance here and there, such as Uther telling Arthas that he hopes there's a special place in hell waiting for him, or the name Hellfire Peninsula for instance, but it's not used in a religious sense or to imply that it is the origin point of demons. And I like that it turns Warcraft from a medieval fantasy world which somehow met Jesus to something more original which also allows for the expansion of the mythos and avoids real world controversy for the most part. Though I guess a Diablo crossover would have been pretty funny. And number one is... I am pleased by your people seeing the uptale. Their spirits and powers have been honed in this harsh wilderness. Their courage alone may be enough to... Lord Illidan, new arrivals come to greet you. We Draenei have fought the orcs and their demon masters for generations. Now at last, we will end their curse forever. We are yours to command, Lord Illidan. As I promised, your people shall have their vengeance, Akama. By night's end, we will all be drunk with it. Bosh, Kale, give the final order to strike. The hour of wrath has come. Number one on my list is the changing of the Draenei storyline in Burning Crusade, which was actually partially an accident. Uh, from Warcraft 3 The Frozen Throne up to and including vanilla World of Warcraft, the Draenei were these sort of primitive natives of Draenor who have been in an age-old conflict with the orcs, which mostly ended up in their disadvantage. A few of them managed to stumble into Azeroth during the closing of the Dark Portal, and those lived a primitive existence in the Swamp of Sorrows. And of course, there was absolutely no relation to be found between them and the Eredar. 
Nowadays, the Draenei story is much more complicated, obviously, and the ones we saw in Frozen Throne or in Vanilla have been stated to be broken or lost ones, degenerated Draenei. One little bit that I forgot to mention was that number 5 on my list, the changing of Sargeras' corruption, was actually the second time they retconned that. The first time was this one, because in previous lore, the Erdar were stated to be one of the original evil races of the universe who helped corrupt Sargeras, which is obviously not the case anymore. Anyway, I like this retcon because it pushed the Draenei in, in, in an interesting and new direction, and their storyline is perhaps one of the most tragic in the whole Warcraft universe. The Draenei are actually one of my personal favorite races in the lore, and this retcon obviously allowed for their entire development as a species and as individual characters. Really, the only noteworthy individual Draenei before the retcon were Akama and Kumisha. Now we have Velen, Nabundo, one of my personal favorites, uh, Marad, Irel, and so on and so forth. It also added another connection with Kil'jaeden and Archimon, giving them another dimension than the sort of uh, mustache-twirling villains they were beforehand, though Archimon is still somewhat underdeveloped when compared with Kil'jaeden. This retcon, besides establishing for almost so intents and purposes a new fascinating race, also greatly developed the Burning Legion storyline, not to mention the small storylines which have involved Draenei, Draenei or Eredar ever since. And this brings us to the end of another top whatever list. I hope I didn't come off as picking Arden Warcraft 2 and 1 too much. Uh, they are still wonderful games and they obviously helped establish this franchise, despite the fact that much of the things which happened in those games has been retconned ever since. Um, other than that, I would like to hear your thoughts in the comments below. You're obviously free to disagree or agree with me. And uh, if there are any retcons that you personally like, uh, I'd like to hear them. Retcons are obviously a uh, pretty divisive topic among the lore community, so uh, le just remember that we're all friends here. Um, other than that, I'll see you all next time. Farewell.